So I have the pleasure now of introducing someone whose career I have admired from afar, and it's so gratifying when I reached out to him to find out that he was equally enthused with what we're building. Um, John Gerzema actually hails from our world. Um, he's got a very storied advertising career, and he's now an author, and his books have been on bestseller lists of, of all, you know, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, USA Today. Um, and The Athena Doctrine is a fascinating book, and what a, really appealed to me about having John come speak to us, hailing back to my opening remarks, is data. Data will always set us free. Data will always be your friend when you're trying to encourage somebody to see the world differently. And the data that John has amassed and the way he's made it accessible to people is life-changing. So please join me in welcoming an awesome ad man turned change agent, John Gerzema. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you. How's everybody? I know I'm standing between you and lunch, so I'm going to get right into it. Um, so yeah, we decided to call this, uh, the, the brief version of this talk, 64,000 people can't be wrong. And I'll try to unpack that and see if it holds water over the next uh, few minutes. But um, what we did is we looked at research and data for this book that I wrote called The Athena Doctrine, How Women and the Men Who Think Like Them Will Rule the Future. And basically, the, the book started, uh, Michael D'Antonio and I began this book writing a, a title that we said, What People Want. And we started to get into the data, and we uncovered that actually what people wanted were more feminine values in the world. And we're going to talk about that and try to connect that with leadership. And um, what I'll do is kind of start and talk a little bit about the data. We did gather data from all over the world. I run a consultancy that has steeped data from Brand Asset Valuator. And what we did is we kind of looked at data from Canada to Chile, from sort of US to Indonesia. And we gathered a whole bunch of samplings from citizens across these countries. And we asked them a bunch of questions about leadership, about life, about success, and about sort of where the world was going. And the other thing we did on top of this is we traveled all over the world. Um, I think I had hair when I started this project. but. Um, <laughs> We, you know, we were everywhere. We were in Iceland, we were in, in Argentina, and we talked to leaders in STEM. We talked to um, interesting people that were sort of starting new companies, a lot of Fortune 500 CEOs, and we also talked to world political leaders. And one of the guys that we interviewed was a 90-year-old president of Israel, Shimon Peres. And he said something to me that I'll never forget. He said, we're in a new world with many old minds. Right? We're in a new world with many old minds. And he said, the task of a leader is to adapt yourself. Right? So here we have a leader at 90 years old starting to rethink the rubric of leadership. And I think that's really what this conference is all about, the role that we have as creative thinkers, as sort of marketers of culture, to really think through our, our, our big role in, in the context of what that is all about. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the data. Uh, one of the interesting things, we gathered all kinds of different things, but one of the ones that we really liked was this question where two thirds of people around the world thought the world would be a better place if men thought more like women. Um, interestingly enough, Canadian men must be doing something right. They had the lowest levels of dissatisfaction go Canada. But um, what we decided to do, we got really interested in these questions around gender. And I'm by no means a gender expert. I'm a planner. I'm a researcher. But we decided to look at our sample. And we divided it up between 32,000 people around the world. We asked them to basically classify a lot of different human traits as whether they were masculine or feminine or neither. So we did that with one half of our sample. But in the other half of our sample, we asked the exact same questions, but there was no mention whatsoever of gender. We just said, tell us what is missing in a modern leader. What are the things that we need to have a more moral society? What do we need in ourselves as executives to be more successful as we think about this social, interdependent, transparent world that we live in? And what we did is we modeled the data, and it was really interesting to us to see that the essence of a modern leader is more feminine in the eyes of 64,000 people in 13 countries around the world. So this is the modeled SKUs, and this sort of is interesting to us. I think if you look at the left-hand side where they looked at things that were more masculine, what I thought was so interesting about this is that you see the things over there that say things like aggression, pride, analytical. Like that's like almost the playbook of your traditional archetype of a CEO, right? And yet, what they said were more important, the feminine qualities of being expressive, right? How do you take your mission, your vision, and relate that into terms that people are going to understand, that are going to connect with people, 
right? The ideas of planning for the future, we're gonna talk about that, the importance of patience. The ideas of reason, loyalty, flexibility, collaboration. We're gonna come on and talk about empathy. Empathy is absolutely essential in terms of what's driving the characteristic of the true modern leader today. And then this idea of sort of passion, collaboration, but also a sense of selflessness. And so when we kind of stepped back and we looked at all of these different traits, what was really important to understand is this ultimately, the book isn't a gender war at all. It's not about men versus women. It's the fact that people think that around the world, if you're gonna navigate tomorrow's 21st century environment, you better have these traits, whether you're a man or a woman. And so what we did then with the data is we kind of went out and started talking to people. And we found some really interesting people that were already sort of on the cusp of this sort of, sort of thinking. So we'll talk through those. And, and I, what I'll do real briefly in our time is kind of take four of these sort of principles. But the, the things that we pulled out of our data and our sort of travels got us to these characteristics of, of leadership. And we said, you know what? You may already need to be aggressive and resilient. Those are important characteristics at times for leaders, but how do you build these into your style of leading? Or how do you build them into your teams in a way that really can champion you and, and make your team stronger? So we'll look at four of them. The first one is this thing that we call the Army of Davids, which is the rise of connected people and how socially they're building a better and stronger world. Um, what we saw in our data was a lot of distrust of institutions, for example. 86% of people thinking that there's too much power in the hands of large institutions. So in order to be more authentic, a large institution either has to get small and start collaborating, or they really need to connect in the broader world. And so one of the guys that, that we interviewed was in Reykjavik. And I guess one of the themes we got out of the book was there was ultimately a feminine response to crisis. Quite by accident, Michael and I ended up in places of crisis. And one of the places was in Iceland. You know, there you had seven investment bankers that basically broke the country. And what they had to do was repair the trust. And so this guy, this guy is Orrin Bardur Johnson, and he is a Lutheran minister, and he's kind of the Gary Trudeau of Iceland, right? He's a columnist and he's a satire. He basically was making fun of the government, so much so that they elected him to the provisional government to clean up the mess. So he got in with a group of men and women, and they thought, nobody trusts our government. And so they thought, you know what, we've got to do something radically different. So they went to Twitter, to Facebook, to Instagram, to all these social media, and they asked people their opinions. They said, tell us about what we should do to basically change our constitution. And that's what they did. They crowdsourced a draft of a new constitution. And that process, that inclusiveness, was the beginning of starting to rebuild that authenticity. Interestingly, one of the most amazing places we visited was Kenya. I mean, this is a country that is accelerating in, in huge regard, and a lot of it is on the basis of collaboration. So this is Lucy Mariki, and she's part of Kalimo Salama, and she's one of these powerful women Kenyan farmers. And in Kenyan society, farming is everything. And also women, they have seen through all their data that women as farmers reinvest back into their families and they're essential to the livelihood of Kenyan culture. The problem was the margins on being a farmer in Kenya are very slight. And so if you had a farm that suffered a drought, you couldn't afford crop insurance. But that's where Safaricom and M-Pesa and this concept called Ushahidi comes in. Ushahidi is a Swahili word that means testimony. And it was used during the political election violence where a guy that we interviewed set up sort of a Foursquare-like concept where citizens could re report where violence was and that would help the police go to those areas. So sort of a Foursquare for policing. Well, they took that concept and Rose Goslinga, who we interviewed, she got together with this concept and started to build crop insurance based on weather vanes. Do you see that little steel pole behind her? That's basically a $10 weather vane. They signed up 16,000 farmers to participate in this program where your crops would basically be measured by the weather vane and you would then get a text through M-Pesa to help you replant your crops. So really interesting concepts of collaboration, sort of low tech solutions that are bringing together a lot of really interesting businesses across the Kenyan countryside. One of my favorite interviews from the book was this young guy, this is Fukuzaki-san. And he was so pissed off at the government after the, the crisis of the tsunami and earthquake because the government basically drug its feet. 
It did not, like we had here with our hurricane, they did not have an adequate and fast response. Now this is a kid who was in the University of Tokyo dorm room, and he told me in our interview, he said, you know what, I decided I wanted to help displaced families. And the way I did it is he goes, I basically hacked an Airbnb. So he went on, he wrote some code, and he put up in 48 hours this really provisional type of new um, Airbnb that ultimately connected 12,000 families that had extra rooms with people that needed them. So my point here is we think about leadership, guys, is that the, nation, the whole na notion of where leadership is that it's coming top down is not happening. And that's particularly important with millennials. This is a kid who just said, my government's not doing its job and I've got a solution to go at it. And this is the sort of Athena thinking that we're starting to see out of these people as we travel the world. Uh, some of the people were, that we interviewed um, were researchers and had some interesting concepts as well. This is Maria Ziv, and we interviewed her in Sweden. And she's the director of the Swedish Tourism Bureau. And like a researcher, she had a business problem. Her business problem was is that when they, she did surveys around the world and asked people, what are the first things you think about when you think of Sweden? They said blonde people and ABBA. <laughs> it's kind of a problem though. You know, if you're the head of tourism for Sweden, people are like, know everything there is to know about Sweden. I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> so she said, no, we're gonna show the authentic portrait of what Sweden is all about, but we're also gonna create a civic experiment. So if any of you guys are on Twitter, make sure you're following at Sweden. Have you heard of what she did? She went to the government and asked for the official Twitter account. And she gave it over to one citizen to tweet on behalf of the country each week. So they had farmers, they had priests, they had truck drivers, people just talking about true authentic life in Sweden. Now Michael and I came back, we started putting together the book and we got a call from the Atlantic Magazine because they had found out that someone had come on and said all these hateful things. So we rushed back out to reach to her to see what they were gonna do. And they decided to let it play itself out because in a matter of hours, thousands and thousands of Swedish citizens had retweeted this person back into submission. So the idea of sort of candor, openness, and collaboration, but also the authenticity of a government to sort of participate in that experiment we thought was obviously very Swedish, but also very, very important. Let's look at a second leadership trait. You know, we looked at uh, the midterm elections tomorrow and there's all this sort of consternation about pol politic politics and sort of people not really sort of getting along and infighting. Well, we found a whole bunch of interesting thinkers that were thinking differently and thinking longer term. And part of that was based on our data because people are looking for leaders that are building cultures. And this was incredible for us to see this question. Around the world, two thirds of people said they'd work for less money at a company whose culture and values they believed in. That, now that's been the core of our business, right? In our industry, we want to have that inside advertising agencies. And yet when you look around the world, people feel that's missing. So the leader that can see farther is increasingly an important leader. All kinds of really interesting people we met, but Margarita Bernal was one of my favorites. She is a civil engineer in Medellin, Colombia. And when you think of engineers, you think of them locked away in their offices, designing sort of anonymous infrastructure projects for cities. Well, she got out and lived with the people. And one of the things she realized is she started to crowdsource ideas, which is what would have the biggest long-term impact on Medellin society. And as she started to talk to people, she realized that there were all these people on the other side of the mountains that separated the favelas from central Medellin that did not have economic opportunity. The result became the most popular infrastructure project that has ever been done in Colombia, which is the Metro cable car. You know, and by the fact of her not just sitting behind a desk, but getting out and really living with the people has created a big long-term and systemic change in Colombian society. Hey, I gotta tell you on this book, we also ate really well. This is uh, Gaston Achuro. He is sort of the Mario Batali of Peru. He took Peruvian cuisine to a whole new level, but core to what he did is he wanted to create values inside his restaurant empire. So if you've ever heard of the Parachutec cooking school, that is going into the favelas, basically pulling out all these incredible young men and women with potential and training them to become three and four star chefs. Again, he felt he needed to have that core into his business. Really interesting people, even in government. This is uh, Maria Demanichi. 
And she thought long term about how she was going to solve two problems because she is head of the European Fisheries Commission. And her two problems were unemployed fishermen because so much fish had been sort of overfished in the Atlantic waters and also this problem of pollution. So I don't know if you've heard of these plastic barges, you know, all this plastic in the ocean. So she kind of got together and she decided to send all these unemployed fishermen out to fish for plastic. So you put a price on plastic the same way she'd put a price on cod or tuna. My point is, is so many of these thinkers, these Athena thinkers, brought their whole selves to work. They brought their whole selves into the challenge. They didn't think inside the existing structures. And they thought in an entirely new, different way. Because Maria, her entire life, she had grown up in Crete, understanding the, the sort of culture of fishing and understanding the importance of our environment. So bringing those values into her work really got her to do something different in a really unique way. Uh, we loved interviewing Zoe Palmer. She does an incredible job inside Hackney uh, in East London, teaching young kids, impoverished kids, how to raise um, and develop their own businesses. And part of the Golden Company's core business is um, raising and collecting honey off of beehives. Now, what was interesting is she went downtown one day and met a whole bunch of investment bankers. And a bunch of these kids came in and did basically a symposium on how to take care of stuff. The investment bankers were so impressed that they now have beehives on the top of the London Stock Exchange. Uh, and then, you know, this is, if you just think about the systemic problems we have in life today, you start to feel a little bit better about the actions of some of these people. And this is uh, an Israeli and a Palestinian. They're both VCs, Yadin Kaufman and Saheed Nashef. And they got together and they created Sadara Ventures Partnership. And this is a, a joint group to take Israeli startup VC future profits and future cash off of stock that gets generated and fund West Bank startups. And as they told me, they said, we can't control the political dialogue. We can't control all the friction and, and hatred that exists in the world. But we can try to get young people to work together to start companies. And that's where they're after. Recently, they just sold Ways, And so they're using that as a foundation to build these types of startups in the West Bank. So we'll look at a third one. I talked a little bit briefly about empathy. And you guys, I can't stress how important that is today for modern leadership. And I think when we think about the word empathy, we don't think of that as like a business term, right? Empathy sounds like your mom or your grandma. Well, empathy is brilliant customer service, right? It's, it can be incredible levers for creating a value in businesses. And the importance of this empathy is people don't think it exists. Right? We, uh, we were staggered to see some of these responses in our data, but 76% of people in these 13 countries we surveyed feels that their country's leaders don't care about their citizens nearly as much as they used to. So how do we think about building empathy into our businesses? We found some really interesting companies uh, that were doing just that. Um, this is Anna Pearson um, from Spots of Time. And Anna had an interesting insight on volunteering. Does anybody volunteer? Raise your hand if you do any volunteering. Do you feel like you do a great job at volunteering? Yes. Do you ever get in a situation, now be honest with me, you guys, do you ever get in a situation where you feel overextended, like you don't do enough, and you create sort of volunteering dissonance? Well, that's what she understood about volunteering. And so she kind of looked at Foursquare and micro lending, and she mashed them up together, and she created spots of time. This was solely designed so that you could be vetted into the program, you get the app, you get off the tube at Notting Hill or wherever you're at, and you find things that are good deeds to do in your area. And every one of them can be done within 45 minutes. So go volunteer at an at a after-school reading session or deliver groceries to a senior citizen. The whole idea there was to sort of take the concept of micro-lending and create micro-volunteering. What I thought was interesting about the empathy is she didn't train the empathy on the people that needed the help. She put it on the volunteers in a way that could make it more accessible. Uh, some of these are really powerful, and they're, and they're really controversial. Um, but Catalina Coduque is doing, doing some of the most important work of anyone that we interviewed as we traveled the world for this book. And um, she has created uh, the Mi Sangre Foundation in Medellin to repatriate ex-FARC soldiers back into society. Now, many of these rebel soldiers were sort of drug as young boys into the jungles 
and they've created you know, a whole bunch of different atrocities that have been terrible, but she's created what she calls peace camps, which are empathy, where these soldiers come back into society and live with people in the towns as well as even potentially some people that they once victimized. Her whole point was helping people see each other, the victim and the accuser, in a way that could start to build bridges and allow people to heal and move forward. She and the efforts of many other NGOs in Colombia have repatriated more than 15,000 soldiers in the last three years. Dr. Joseph Coughlin, though, is a, probably the clearest connection I can give you guys between sort of empathy and creating sort of value in our industry. And so I don't know if you guys have heard of him. He's the um, head of the MIT School for Aging. So, you know, we are in this world, right? We're senior citizens. Hey, as marketers, it's a big business opportunity. But we started to realize that he could take empathy and make it really powerful and make it a lever for business. And so what he created was this idea called AGNES, which stands for Age Gain Now Empathy System. Basically, this thing looks like a hockey mask. It's a big hockey goalie's outfit, and designers wear it, but it mimics the effects of aging. Right, so it like dulls your eyesight and hearing, it puts pressure on your joints, and these designers and engineers try to go and walk around, and they try to drive cars, they try to products at store shelves, and suddenly they realize what it's like to really be in that world. So he believes that this sort of breaking the fourth wall of empathy is gonna unlock, unlock all kinds of new innovation. And I think it's really interesting today, I don't know if you guys read a, a few months ago about the prison warden in Colorado, that decided to put himself into solitary confinement to understand what that is. So I mean, as a planner, I'm really fascinated by this type of work because this is the type of thinking where you can take empathy and really connect in new ways to create innovation. Some of them are really, really fun. This is Katie Moat. She's an incredible, interesting young entrepreneur in the UK. She's the founder of Granny's Inc. Has anybody heard of Granny's Inc.? So Granny's Inc. is um, handcrafted scarves and hats knitted by real life grannies. <laughs> it's sort of a cross between Etsy and AARP. <laughs> but the cool thing about it, check out their website, it's grannysinc.co.uk. But what you do is, first thing you do is you go onto the website and you gotta pick out a granny. And so we went up into the countryside, Michael and I, and we interviewed Holly Jones, one of the grannies. And she talked about how she designs these scarves, usually puts a little message of hope and inspiration, and sends it off in sort of that brown box. You remember being a kid and getting that brown box from grandma? But what Katie decided to do is she realized there was sort of a cultural thing here afoot where many young millennials like herself felt you know, distanced from their grandparents for one reason or another. The tagline for Granny Zinc is, there's wisdom in the wool. Shira Chef, um, I have to be honest, I interviewed him as a journalist and then I became a member of his board. I was so amazed with what he's doing. But he runs an NGO called University of the People. And it's the world's first tuition-free online university. It's an incredible program based on empathy. And it's the connection between kids that want to learn at all costs and the teachers that will be out there to do it. So 80% of his kids are in the bottom 20% of GDP producing countries. So they don't have access to, to great education the way that we do here in the States. But what he did is he went after the empathy of teachers. Does anybody have a teacher in the audience? What do teachers want to do? Teachers want to teach, right? Even if you're not paying them, they'll teach. My mom's a retired English professor at Indiana University. I sent her the manuscript for the book. She's like, honey, it was really good, but there were some run-on sentences and <laughs> dangling participles and all this stuff. But my point here with Shai is that he went out and reached out to university professors. He got 2,500 volunteers from the best schools around the world. And it's an online university. And now in its fourth year, they're graduating students. And these are kids that are working on first-generation iPhones and Blackberries in internet cafes in war-torn regions because they want to learn. And there's a whole bunch of teachers that want to teach them. So one of the, the great stories that we cover in the book is the story of this young man, Zhou Jin, who was studying in a tent in Haiti after the earthquake and just got accepted to NYU Business School. But the point here is this is the world we live in. This is the 21st century. And yet, so many of these leadership models are built on 20th century ideals. 
And so the people that can take the technology, that can take these feminine values of empathy, collaboration, patience, drive these into creating new innovation are going to be the people that are going to win in the future. They're going to be the true disruptors. So we'll look at one more. And it was interesting in that previous panel this morning, uh, the talk about you know women will really state it the way it is. I think there was a more colorful word for it. But um, I think it's really important to look at the strength of feminine values and candor, because there's not enough of it in our political discourse, and there certainly isn't enough of it in business. And guess what? People want it. And people believe you have to have it. If you're not open, honest, and flexible, you're going to be roadkill in the future. And so we saw some really amazing people that were being candid. And I actually go as far as saying being vulnerable. Um, this was, again, one of my favorite interviews from the book. This is Dr. Ayad Maddish. And he's the founder of ResearchGate.org. And he got to this innovation through basically being chastised by asking for help. So he's got a PhD in virology. And he was going around to his peers at university asking for help in his, in his assignments. And they said, you know what? You look foolish. Like, just get on and do your work. And he realized that science was all about me. You know, it wasn't about we. And it was a bunch of people that were hiding in cubicles. They'd go to a conference like this. They'd, they'd present one part of a scientific discovery, get patted on the back, and they'd go back to their cubicle. He wanted to actually open that up and socialize it to this sense of vulnerability. He went and he said, I don't have all the answers. And so what he did is he created ResearchGate. So today, he has 2.8 million scientists collaborating on 800,000 different research projects. It's the Facebook for scientists. <laughs> and the reason he got there is that he was open and honest about what he doesn't know. And I think that's what's so important today. You, know, you can't open a business book or an article about um, without it saying something about learning from failure. Learning from failure is the most guy concept ever created. <laughs> and the reason it is, is it's just permission to just go off and do anything and then sweep it under the rug and move to the next thing. What Dr. Maddish taught me is there'd be far less failing if we admitted what we don't know in the first place. So I asked him what he wants to do with this. He goes, I want to crowdsource a Nobel Prize. And I want the, the credits to run like the end of a movie screen. Um, Hala Tomasur, incredible woman. She runs a hedge fund in, in Reykjavik. And here's the headline. It was the only one that didn't go under. And the reason it didn't go under is she was focused on risk and open and honesty. Equally is the case of creating new businesses. This is Tim Kunde, who's the founder of Friendsurance. Has anybody heard of Friendsurance? So Tim's a great Athena thinker, I think. He looked at an industry that he felt was ripe for disruption, which was insurance. And his insight was is that most people don't like insurance companies. They're institutional, and as a result, there's actually a lot of fraud. And when there's fraud and false claims, that raises the premiums for everybody else. So he thought maybe there's a way to build candor into a business model that made it more accountable and more intimate. So he created Friend Insurance. And friend insurance goes like this. You go in and you buy insurance with a group of friends, up to seven people. Let's take car insurance. If you drive safely, all of your premiums will get, go down. But if one of you gets in an accident, your premiums go up and everybody pays that claim jointly. So just think about your friends you would do this with, right? <laughs> Versus the ones you wouldn't. Well, guess what happened? It's behavioral economics at play, right? People now feel accountable. He's basically atomized insurance into intimate relationships of trust. This was the case. We interviewed Giles um, Horton, who's the, the co-founder of peer-to-peer -peer lending, Zopa, in the UK, on the same principle. How do you build openness and intimacy into a model that can actually disrupt an industry? He's now doing testing on health and finding people are smoking less, eating more healthfully, because they want to be accountable to people in their circles. So candor at play uh, was also the day when we spent this freezing day in Stockholm with uh, Jonas Vig and Mans Alder. And they started a really interesting technology called Bamboozer. I don't know if anybody uses this, but this is an app that when you open it up and start shooting video off your phone, it basically goes live to your social graph. OK? No, 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 no skipping in between. They thought they were doing something for entertainment, only to realize that they were the first website to be shut down by the Egyptian government. 
And the reason being, obviously, is that kids in Tahir Square were broadcasting you know, the, the Arab Spring. And so I guess my point on candor is you've got these two young guys of sort of moderate to probably not so well-developed hygiene that <laughs> I spent three hours with these guys that basically were as every bit as more powerful as any institution in the Middle East at the time. And you know, we went there and they had two servers. One had a post-it note on it that said Syria and the other one said Iraq. So this is the world that we live in. If you just take it into just the way that we have to think about ourselves even in business and as executives, this sense of openness and candor is gonna be the only way to go. And lastly, I think this is really an important aspect of candor is this concept around how do you take a problem, be so open and honest with yourself that you actually find a new route to a solution. And that was the case with Sylvia Lally, um, an incredible, amazing woman. She runs the Women's House in Lima, Peru, which is a domestic shelter for women and children. And decades she's been doing this. In decades, the police, which at the time were all men, turned a blind eye toward the crisis. So it was the same old pattern on and on again. And she told me um, that she got really ticked off and she decided to create her own all women's police force. Guess what happened? Five years into it, the local city government in Lima realizes that these women are incredibly competent and they integrate them with the men. Two years more go on and corruption drops by 31%. So my point here is that this now has started to abate. There's been a more open, candid dialogue on domestic abuse toward women, but it's been brought about by a very sort of alateral, sort of asymmetrical solution to the problem. But you know, she told us, she said, if I don't feel the sense of doing something entirely different, I'm never gonna solve this problem. I think that's sort of the human struggle with all of us, right? Is how do we be open and honest with ourselves, open and honest with our business associates and our family in ways that are gonna really get us to move forward. And um, I'll leave you with this last thought. This was a, a guy that we interviewed in Bhutan. It is not easy to get to Bhutan. Um, but we interviewed the secretary of the Gross National Happiness Commission. And it's incredible, right? So this is a tiny economy, a tiny you know, Himalayan nation, Bhutan, that has guys like me going there. They're the darlings at Davos. And the thing is, is this little country has hit on something, right? They've hit on this idea that you need to open the aperture on how you define GDP, right? So GDP is not just about how much money you make, it's about your environment, your education, your life, your family, and all the other things that we, that we value and purportedly treasure. But I think the point and the reason they become such sort of a media darling is that intuitively we feel this stuff is missing in our lives. And I think that's the, the opportunity with the Athena Doctrine, with these types of thinkers, is to celebrate the rise of feminine values, because I truly believe we're on the cusp of a feminine age. This isn't just a couple of books. This is the idea of, of a larger movement toward greater ethics, greater transparency, but also sort of greater partnership in a way that's gonna create more value for more people. Um, and so that's why I, I basically say that, you know, I think that Feminine values are the operating system of the 21st century. And it's not exclusively limited to women, right? These are values that if men get a hold of and understand, they're gonna be disruptors, not only in their careers, but they're gonna create businesses that are gonna connect in that way as well. So I think it's, you know, it's really important. There was discussion earlier about Lean In. Lean In is awesome and, and, and Cheryl's incredible what she's done. But I think politics, business, and society need to lean in. And so the innate skills, the innate traits, the, the things that, that who you are and what you do, these are things that the world is starting to line up with. And that's the thing I, I really wanna urge you as we start to take on this sort of 97%, we're gonna move there. We're gonna move there in a new way because we're not just gonna talk about diversity and inclusivity because it's a nice thing. We're gonna talk about it because it's bottom line performance. We're gonna talk about it creating greater innovation, greater teamwork, greater customer centricity, the things that are gonna actually differentiate our companies from each other. So that's really what the, what the book is all about. Um, I'd be honored if you guys are on Twitter or on Facebook, if you'd support our, our cause, Girl Up. It's www.girlup.org or at Girl Up on Twitter. Um, all proceeds of the book support Girl Up. 
our royalties. And what we're so amazed, I'm a board member with this group, this is an amazing organization that's helping tween girls find their voice as leaders by advocating and raising money for other at-risk girls around the world. It's just a whole pile of goodness, and I hope you check it out. So with that, I'll open it up for any questions, and thank you very much. Hi. I've got a question over here. One more guess. I have one question here I'll start with, and then I'll let you ask that one. Um, the question was, one most compelling story. Um, what I didn't talk about was um, a woman that we met in Tokyo um, called Eriko Yamaguchi. And she had been bullied as a child growing up um, in school, and she had to be homeschooled. And she became a fashion designer and started to design handbags. And she took that feeling of being bullied and she decided to create um, sort of a, a social cause into her business. And uh, it was a really incredible story, but she got help from her parents and Kickstarter and basically leased a factory in Bangladesh because she wanted to help workers there. And she, it's pretty crazy, but these guys were um, designing bags, handbags. They were going to do handbags for very discerning Tokyo women, but they were doing um, burlap bags for grain and potatoes. And she taught them how to become high-end Louis Vuitton-like handbags. And she's got an amazing company called motherhouse.co.jp, uh, I believe. And she's now got seven stores in Tokyo, and she pays her um, workers double the average wage of any sector in Bangladesh. And um, she's probably 26 years old. So you know, the power of, of these values, I think, connect with people, and, and I think they can differentiate. Sorry, there was another question out there. These lights are kind of bright off my Hi, bald head. Over I can't here. See. Hello. Hey. Um, all right, it's not really a question. It's more or less validating what you're saying. But I think it's really insightful, um, this notion of empathy and candor in advertising. Because there's a stigma that advertising can be full of a lot of shallow jerks. And I recently just kind of lived that out. Um, I'm, I'm a, a group creative director at uh, YNR Group in Seattle. And I recently hired a creative director, and he was heavily recruited around town. And I said, you know, what, what made you come here? This is, I'm, I'm surprised. And he said, not surprised that he would come to us, but what was the final, you know, what was the tipping point? And he said, you, me, you seem like a really good person, and you seem honest. And I've just worked with so many people now that they, they don't care about me and they don't tell me the truth, and I get into yeah. these organizations and find out what, what it's really like, and you went out of your way to avoid that. Uh, so I thought that's, that's really insightful, and I think women, I think you're right, I think women bring more of that to the table. We tend to be more empathetic, and we tend to be more honest. That sounded terrible. Uh, we don't tend to, I think the, the candor is kind of just inherent. And, uh, and we should celebrate that, and we should use that to our advantage. So thanks for, I, I didn't actually put it all together. I blew off his comments until I was sitting here listening to you thinking, wow, that, that's a real advantage, and I, ha I really had no idea um, how, how, how powerful it was. And that's what makes you authentic, so congratulations. <laughs> Great, well, I, I know you guys are so hungry, so I'm like gonna, <laughs> I'm going to like get off the stage, but I'll be around. Oh, one last question. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I live in New York. I work in New York. I own a music company. And my, I have two little kids, um, an eight-year-old daughter and a five-year-old son. And I recently went to two different lectures at the school on raising children. And I was heading into it. I was really concerned about my daughter because they're so psychological. I don't know who has daughters, but... It's very dramatic. The last thing I say to her at night is, okay, stop talking. Let's go to sleep. And she wants to talk and talk and talk and talk it out. But my son, um, one thing I learned at the lecture is that little boy's um, empathy is the hardest trait to teach. Little mm. girls naturally talk a lot, but little boys, they don't talk. They give you one-word answers, and then they, they wrestle it out. They punch each other or they tease each other. And then they grow in to be men and they run ad agencies, and mostly music companies. <laughs> they, they run all but three music companies, I can tell you. But, uh, 
you know, one thing that we, if we want this to be the world of tomorrow, I mean, did you, yeah. any of your research, I'm just curious if it came about to like, what we can do to raise not just our daughters, but our sons. Yeah. You know, my son is five and, and he, you know, he loves me and he's really sweet. And I want him to grow up to be a man like that, not to grow out of that. Yeah. And did you come across anything that we can, you can give us that we can do to like raise our children to, to be people like this? Yeah, I, it's an excellent point and I guess, I guess purposely what I wanted to do with this brief talk, I mean, we interviewed 120 different thinkers and businesses, they're all in the book, um, The Athena Doctrine That Supports the Girl Up. Um, but the important thing about it was I wanted to show you guys equal amounts, men and women, and it was quite by accident when we came back, we did the data and we came back and looked at the interviews, we didn't really have a prescribed who we were gonna go talk to. We came back and it was literally nearly 50-50 in terms of the most interesting people that we thought were deemed worthy for the book. So by no means is this uh, a mainstream concept and I think that's the opportunity, right? I think, you know, Tim Kunde at Friendsurance, he wasn't sitting there saying, I'm an Athena thinker. He was saying, wow, what if I made, you know, insurance more human and more open and honest? So I think a lot of this is really sort of breaking unconscious bias that exists inside companies and ad agencies are terrible at it, which is why we have this conference, but starting to really you know, champion these values. And the way I came at it wasn't at diversity and inclusivity. I came at it the way that business and for men generally think about it, which is you know, performance. So you know, these are people starting to build companies, starting to disrupt industries by thinking this way. I'll also say that some of the best reactions I've gotten from the book have been young guys that have said, oh, you're telling me I can be myself at work, which is the stuff we all gotta work on, you know? And so that was our attempt to try to connect these, these feminine skills and values to, to what really moves the cash register. Does there anyone have a better answer than me to that question? <laughs> no, seriously, come to the mic. Please. Check out www.supportingoursons.org yeah. and read Real Boys. Um, you'll find a lot of great information there about how to support your sons. Yeah, and meet Ray. Where's Ray? Raise your hand, Ray. Ray's doing really interesting work in this, car in this area as well. Great. I think I'm getting called off the stage, so adios. Thank you guys so much for your time. Thanks. Thanks.